Mormonism is just another Christian denomination. You're wrong for attacking Mormons, all secondary issues. So all the stuff that you are hammering on about last week are all secondary issues. We're no different than the Baptists, the Catholics, you name it. We all believe the same things, the same God. Why are you attacking us? And so they can become almost, it's almost a a clever, debilitating move because you're putting an accusation on the table saying, you're not acting very Christ-like because you're you're making me out to be something that I'm not. You're being divisive among the brethren, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so obviously this attempt at victimizing yourself is a common one that any group in social media can do, and the best way to respond to that is, first of all, actually get back to the real issue. If you were the one who attacked first, you're not the victim because I fought back. But the key emphasis is to point out to every Mormon, even when you're the first person to initiate the conversation and say, do you realize Joseph Smith was a false prophet? And they take the victim route. The first and most important thing to understand isn't to get into semantics about, well, what makes a denomination? I can't spell that, let alone get into an extensive conversation about it, and it wouldn't get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not to talk about, well, what are the main differences, and why do you think the Baptists are always at the throats of the Catholics, and et cetera, et cetera. The key is, again, you're talking to the Mormon. What do you need to know about Mormonism? that will show rule three at its finest, Mm -hmm. that when you ask the question, why do you think you are just another Christian denomination? They are the one who put that forward. You know that the founding of Mormonism started in a universal and absolute condemnation of all denominations, past, present, and future. Mm. So if they are gonna put themselves in a victim card, with the presupposition that contradicts what started Mormonism, they are either lying to you or they've been lied to and want to use that tactic because victimhood is currency Mm. in the West. Here is, of course, where the rubber meets the road. If you make the claim, show them where and when, fall rule number two. You hope they can show their proof? Well, let's show ours. In History of the Church, Volume 1, and you can read this on churchofjesuschrist.com, or org, excuse me, and of course at chapter 2, where the chapter heading titled is Hear Him, they've altered it a bit. We'll read both versions, but the relevant verse, before we get into the whole chapter, is a quote from Elohim, from God the Father, where Joseph Smith had asked the question, which denomination should I join? He was partial to the Methodist, if anyone was (laughs) interested. But this was the answer he got from God. It says, I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds... Now, quick pause on that. As far as the definition of Christianity in the 1800s is concerned, what creeds and doctrines would have been included in Christianity as it was known then compared to today? Any differences? Athanasian Creed, Nicene Creed, the the, uh, Apostles' Creed, all of these things. Nothing that Joseph Smith was debunking was a recent innovation. And note, he gives a full, flat-out, universal condemnation to, his words, not mine, all of them. Mm. And even goes on to quote... not some, not a few, not all but one. All. <laughs> yes, and he doesn't. Does make, all mean? Does all mean all? <laughs> and that's something that you need to call them out on too. They are all an abomination in his sight. That these professors, that those professors were all corrupt. That they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Now. Those words may seem familiar to you if you're an Old and New Testament grad, but it's ultimately stemming from and standing on the authority of God to universally condemn Christianity as it was known during the time of Joseph Smith. And if you know anything about recent history, you know it hasn't changed much. (laughs) Yeah, we have a very pretty complete 2,000-year history from the very early church fathers who were disciples of the apostles to modern day, yes, we do have divisions, we have denominationalism, there was a reformation that took place. But Joseph Smith wasn't speaking at that time, saying the Protestants were wrong and the Catholics right. are right or vice versa. all of them. That means the Roman Catholics, the Orthodox, 
uh, the reformers, any any offshoot of the reformers. Back then, you know, you would have had the method that you would have had, you know, I don't even know if the what the end results were of the Anabaptists and so on, but, uh, you know, you had the Lutherans. Uh, on and on it goes, <laughs> but that's the point. He notes a universal condemnation. So the, so. so the first response when they say, hey, we're no different, well, wait a minute, how can you say we're no different? when your own prophet said that we're all wrong and corrupt and off. Your church began by saying that every single denomination, apart from what was about to be revealed to him, was false, disgusting in God's mm. sight, and, of course, leading people astray. But just so that now, we're not— how do, they, you know, how do they respond to that? When you, when you put them to the table, I could imagine hearing, well, that's not what he meant, or, well, he just meant that their character was corrupt, not necessarily that— the truth was lost, like Islam. Just stick to the words. He said doctrines and creeds and their professors were, of course, the corrupt ones spoken of mm. in Isaiah and Ezekiel. Are you twisting your prophet's words? And, of course, the most sincere, and I'd say genuine, just get really quiet. And I leave them with that because I'm not there to be a bully. I'm there to show yeah. them that that's not the kind of objection you want to bring up towards Christians because we know you're lying to us. But the point being made is, again, not that they're intentionally doing so. They have been lied to, not to be unexpected from an organization that started from a con man and a paint huffer. But the point being made is, more context is king. So I'm just going to read through the relevant verses. When Joseph Smith sought refuge in a forest where he was seeking prayer for clarity on which church he wanted to join, this is again chapter 2 of the History of the Church, volume 1, Hear Him. This is slightly altered, but the message I think is, um, I guess, sufficient for our point here today. And for those who have been joining us on Apologetics Mondays, keep the foundations of Islam in mind when reading through this. Mm. Satisfied he was alone, Joseph knelt in the cool earth and began to share the desires of his heart with God. He asked for mercy and forgiveness and for wisdom to find answers to his questions. O oh Lord, he prayed, what church shall I join? As he prayed, his tongue seemed to swell until he could not speak. He heard footsteps behind him but saw no one when he turned around. He tried to pray again, but the footsteps grew louder as if someone was coming for him. He sprang to his feet and spun around, but he still saw no one. Suddenly, an unseen power seized him. He tried to speak again, but his tongue was still bound. A thick darkness closed in around him until he could no longer see the sunlight. Doubts and awful images flashed across his mind, confusing and distracting him. He felt as if some terrible being, real and immensely powerful, wanted to destroy him. Exerting all his strength, Joseph called out once more to God. His tongue loosened, and he pleaded for deliverance. But he found himself sinking into despair, overwhelmed by the unbearable darkness, and ready to abandon himself to destruction. At that moment, a pillar of light appeared over his head. It descended slowly and seemed to set, in the, uh, set the woods on fire. As the light rested on him, Joseph felt the unseen power release its hold. The Spirit of God took its place filling him with peace and unspeakable joy. Peering into the light, Joseph saw God the Father standing above him in the air. No one has seen God at any time, anybody? Anyway. And his face was brighter and more glorious than anything Joseph had ever seen. God called him by name and pointed to another being who appeared beside him, saying, This is my beloved son. He said, Hear him. Joseph Smith looked at the face of Jesus Christ. It was as bright and glorious as the Father's. Joseph, the Savior said, thy sins are forgiven. His burden lifted. Joseph repeated his question, what church shall I join? Join none of them, the Savior told him. We went through this. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men and form of godliness, denying the power thereof. The Lord told Joseph that the world was seeped in sin. None doeth good, he explained. They have turned aside from the gospel and keep not my commandments. Sacred truths have been lost or corrupted. But he promised to reveal the fullness of his gospel to Joseph, not to the nations, to Joseph mm -hmm. in the future. Now, 
apart from the disturbing parallels to Muhammad bin Abdullah's own experience when he was first exposed mm -hmm. to the Quran and the revelation of Surah 69 started with a demon crushing him to the point where he thought he was going to die, repeating over and over, I can't read, then when, of course, it released him, then it suddenly became a benevolent spirit and forced him to recite Surah 69 in the opening verses. Now, he wanted to kill himself and one, tried to pursue it several times. His wife and her cousin tried to talk Muhammad out of it. He then was told that was the angel Gabriel to appease him, and the rest is history. But noting this parallel for Mormons to claim common ground with Christians or to, as we said, victimize themselves when challenged, their entire organization is based on an attack of every single creed or doctrine of Christianity from the time of Joseph Smith's first vision, which they all still affirm today. Now, if you're going to undermine the foundations of Mormonism, understand that's the equivalent, speaking to a Mormon, that's the equivalent of us saying, well, Jesus could get things wrong. This, this is our source and foundation of truth. Moses was mistaken in that verse mm -hmm. when he was writing the Old Testament. All of these things are stuff that they have to be accountable to and for. And if you call them out on that desire for self-victimization, and note, there are a lot of things we can discuss in this passage, that Satan transforms himself as the angel of light. Like I mentioned briefly, no one has seen God any time, but the only begotten of the Father, he has revealed him. We can talk about the issues of him putting himself forward as the sole authority of truth and the fruit that came out of that totalitarian state. We can ask when God spoke to the prophets in the past, when did this state of terror and, of course, being restrained from speaking ever have any commonality, that if this is a legitimate account, I'd be more convinced that Joseph Smith was demon-possessed than he was mm -hmm. a prophet of God, but that's beside the point. All you have to focus on is your church started saying the opposite of what you're trying to excuse, and that is key because you're going to hear this more than anyone else, mm. and if you just read the first few pages of their history, History of the Church, Volume 1, you will be able to annihilate hmm. their greatest dodges and get the conversation, and this is key, back onto what actually matters, right, the yeah. gospel. Yeah, it reminds me of some watchtower, Jehovah's Witness, came to my house, and you know I, what came to mind was one of those X-Men 2 Wolverine lines, you picked the wrong house, bub. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I, pity I the soul who goes to that home looking for trouble. Yeah, my wife answered the door. And she's like, "Well, I'm a Christian," and they're like, "We are too." And I, I stepped in and I go, "Well," and I could tell that there was a trainee. It was because they come in twos, and uh, no I said, "Well, you believe and I believe," and I just basically defined who Jesus was. I just said, "Well, here's Jesus according to my faith." How dare you? And uh, here's what Jesus is according to your faith. You and I, would you not agree now in, in light of that? And this, this took all but three minutes. Uh, you and I believe, and this was at the door. I didn't even get him, get him in the house. <laughs> no AC. Uh, but uh, I, <clears throat> I said, uh, wouldn't you agree then that you and I believe in a different Jesus? Who, um, and, they, and the lady goes, yeah, we do. And I go, so do you still want to talk about those differences? She looked at the trainee, and they, they could tell they were really intrigued, like they were really listening. No, that's okay. We're going to leave. And they... Uh, yeah, I couldn't catch them fast enough, but anyhow. Uh, so define the terms. When they say we're the same, you're just basically pointing out, well, go to the genesis of your faith, and the entire reason it exists is in opposition to all that Christianity was and has been for 2,000 years, claiming that historically and in the present moment it has been corrupted, changed, and is not the gospel. Well, I believe what I, I believe John Wesley's presentation of the gospel and some of the other reformers as well. Uh, are you saying that they got it wrong too? And you can just go through history. And uh, wow, what what is the gospel then? <laughs> I was listening to a, a, a bishop who, oh, an ex Mormon bishop. He said uh, one of his tactics was to ask the question. Um, Joseph Smith said that the Book of Mormon contains the truths of the everlasting gospel. That it's uh, and he goes, what does everlasting mean forever? Uh, what does gospel mean? <laughs> and he asks those questions. What do you and he mean goes, by that? and they and they would agree that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. So what does fullness mean? What does everlasting mean? And then he would go through doctrines that are not found in the Book of Mormon, saying, then where are these doctrines? Where are these teachings 
that you'd find in the Pearl Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants, and they couldn't answer. And he says, well, how is it that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel if um, these doctrines are not there? And uh, anyway, um, I digress, but... Uh, 